Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. After a sluggish start to the year, the US equity market finished this week on a positive note. The S&P 500 index finishing the week at a new all-time high, up 1.2% on the week, while the Nasdaq was also up by 2.3%. 2.3%. Tech stocks again to the fore. The S&P index has finally returned to the level it stood at in January 2022, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the intensive phase of interest rate rises that we saw in its wake. It was not such a positive story over here, however, I'm sorry to say, with the FTSE Osha index down 2% on the week and so far down 3.6% this year. The FTSE All World Index was more or less flat, with Japan being the standout performer amongst the leading markets, up 7.5% so far this year, and another good week, the one just passed. Bond yields on both sides of the Atlantic, meanwhile, moved back up again, pretty much across the curve, while oil and copper both edged higher, along with the dollar. Turning to the investment trust universe, with the equity markets down and yields rising, it's no surprise to see the investment trust index decline. It was down around 1.1% this week and 3.4% year-to-date. Losses outnumbered gainers this week by around 3.5 to 1. News flow accounted for two of the extremes. Best performer of the week was Tufton Oceanic, ticker SHIP, SHIP, which was up a short 10% after the board announced the results of a review of its capital allocation policy, aimed at narrowing its 25% discount. The tweaks to its approach included an increased dividend and a potential one-off return of capital which the market evidently liked. At the other end of the scale, topping the list of the losers on the week was Custodian REIT, ticker CREI, the Commercial Property Trust, whose shares were down some 20% following news of a proposed all-share merger between itself and Aberdeen Property Income, ticker API. The latter shares, uh, in contrast, were up around 4.7%. More on this proposed deal in a moment when I discuss the commercial property sector with Marcus Fairmudge, manager of TR Property, one of my two guests this week. There were only two results of any significance from the sector, one coming from a Bankers Trust, the global equity vehicle, which had a so-so year, lagging its benchmark by around 0.6 per annum and delivering a NAV total return of around 5% for its latest reporting period. And Edinburgh Worldwide, ticker EWI, the global smaller companies trust managed by Bailey Gifford, which reported on its second successive year of underperformance, an NAV total return of negative 23% in its latest 12-month period, which is almost 20% behind its benchmark. A pretty remarkable degree of underperformance there. The managers, though, think that its portfolio companies now offer, I quote, robust returns as attractive as at any time in recent memory, close quote. But the board says in its report that it thinks the managers could have done better by taking more profits on some of its earlier handsome gains during the post-pandemic bull market. Interesting to know whether that is a turnaround situation or not. It's one of the trusts where Saba Capital has taken a significant position. There were also updates from around another dozen trusts, including news of a board change at Home REIT, ticker H-O-M-E, Home, where Lynn Fenner has resigned as chairman of the trust, although she will remain on the board for now, and has been replaced by Michael O'Donnell. That trust is holding a presentation for private investors in the coming week to discuss where this particular trouble trust may be going. I comment on recent developments in the latest weekly email for subscribers to the Moneymaker Circle, where you'll also find links to our in-depth latest trust profile, which this week features Sequoia Economic Infrastructure Income, ticker SEQI, and that'll be followed next week by uh, JP Morgan Japanese. And there's a full summary also of all the recent share price, NAV and discount moves across the sector. 
I'm sorry to say there have been some minor glitches in the upgrading of our subscription service, almost certainly the result of my own ham-fisted involvement in the process, but I am sure that these minor glitches will be sorted out imminently. Apologies to anyone who's uh, been unable to access the email. However, I should say, uh, can also always still be seen on the website where it's reproduced in full. In this week's episode of the podcast, I'm going to kick off by talking to Marcus Fairmudge, as I said, the manager of TR Property, ticker TRY, discussing both that custodian Aberdeen property income deal, but also the wider outlook for the commercial property sector, which has perked up since October last year. TR Property shares up 15% over that period. That is followed uh, by the first half of a two-part conversation, which I had this week with John Singer, who is the chairman of Pantheon International, the private equity trust, ticker PIN, which under his lead has adopted a series of measures to address its persistent discount. Uh, Given his many years of experience in the private equity and venture capital business, his views on the existential challenge that he thinks listed private equity trusts face unless they are seen to give greater priority to shareholders' interests are, I think, well worth hearing. They discuss a very important issue for the sector. So this seemed like a very good week to catch up with one of the uh, fund managers that we've spoken to in the past on the podcast, which is Marcus Fairmudge, the uh, manager of TR Property, the only investment trust that invests in the shares of property companies rather than directly. So, Marcus, I might as well dive in immediately by uh, talking about something that happened Today, we're recording this on Friday, the 19th of January, and this morning we heard of another announcement of corporate activity in the listed property sector, and this is a proposed merger between two property companies. One is Custodian, and the other is Aberdeen Property Income. So can I ask you, first of all, before we talk about what you're doing, what are your thoughts on that particular deal? Uh, It's an interesting transaction. I think we applaud both boards for accepting that the world has moved on and there is essentially a a minimum size for listed REITs and that you really do need assets of close to a billion, gross assets, market cap then up at sort of circa 600, 650 million, which is appropriate to get sort of over that magic 500 number. When you look at both companies, it's quite interesting. One has a very loyal, uh, long-standing following, that's custodian. It's always traded in better times a very close or even a premium to its asset value. And it's been at a discount of circa 10% as opposed to API, which has languished at a very, very wide discount. And one of a number of trusts run by Aberdeen, which of course has had lots of its own uh, issues uh, as a fund management uh, business. But all in all, I think at the high level, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, to, as we've spoken about many times in the past, that you, know, you need to get these businesses to a scale size. When you delve into the transaction details, I think at first glance, I would argue that this was an opportunity for the boards when they came together, because these are both externally managed REITs, that I would probably on first glance argue that I'm a little disappointed with the savings that are being made for the collective group. I would have said there was a chance for the boards to really look at bringing the management contract into best-in-class environment. And it's quite simply, that is that these external management contracts should be based on market cap rather than NAV. Because, of course, certainly in the last sort of 18 months, we've seen this dramatic underperformance of listed property companies. And we all know the reasons for that around the movement and the change in the cost of money. And then the reversal of that somewhat uh, in the last quarter of last year and ongoing. But essentially, we've had for a long time, you had a situation where the NAV remained elevated because the valuers are obviously backward looking, but the share prices would, had fallen dramatically. So you had this big gulf, this big discount appearing, but it meant that the management fees that were paid by the REITs were pretty stable, but people who own the companies, the shareholders, were suffering because the share prices were collapsing. In the same way that if you were in better times to trade at a premium to asset value, then I absolutely believe that managers should be rewarded for getting their companies into the right place, uh, attracting investors who are prepared to view that tomorrow was going to be better than today, and therefore they're prepared to pay for a premium for that. And then you would ensure alignment of interest. So that's probably the disappointing factor here. Certainly, judging by the initial share price reaction, the market might share some of those concerns. As we're speaking, I can see that the share price of custodian is down around uh, 10%, I think, and that of Aberdeen Property Income is up around 13%, which otherwise would, would tend to suggest that certainly the shareholders of Aberdeen Property Income have got the better of the deal. Can I ask whether you are a shareholder in either of these two investment trusts? 
Actually, I'm not in either of these vehicles. From our point of view, Custodian is extremely well run by Richard Shepherd Cross. It's good and the stock you know, has always been uh, for us a little bit expensive, but essentially well run and also quite small. It was always likely to be the acquirer than the acquiree. And we tend to favour owning the acquiree and taking that pop as those businesses improve. And we'll come back to them other ones that we've been involved with, uh, hopefully, uh, Jonathan, at this time. In terms of, uh, of API, we just didn't like the asset quality. We felt that it was substandard and we had our reservations about that. But this is, as you say, a, a good deal for API shareholders, uh, for custodian shareholders. They might feel that the deal could have been driven a little bit harder. Um, but you know, I'm afraid what happens is that these companies are very reluctant, boards are very reluctant to be aggressive and therefore they look for uh, an agreement read transaction, which means that essentially you end up with the acquirer probably paying a little bit more than they would like to in order to get the the transaction uh, completed. But yeah, the reaction is, as always, the market is the arbiter and it's really, you can you can see the market response there. The transaction that we are much more heavily involved with and is clearly a much bigger and more important for the market uh, is the proposed merger of LXI and LMP. Indeed. Well, just before we leave the custodian Aberdeen thing, you're right, it does get them up to a combined market value of around, I think, over 500 million, which is good, I guess. But two other thoughts, really. One is, do you think this, in a perfectly functioning capital market, if this is a better deal for Aberdeen Property Income, that somebody else might come along and have a go at it? Would that, do you think, happen in this uh, rarefied world of investment trusts? And just tell me about your thinking about this process. You do better from these particular deals by acquiring, if you like, the less good company rather than uh, sticking with the better company. That doesn't seem particularly um, a fair state of affairs, should we say? Well, there's, there's two points to make here. The first is, do I expect somebody else to come in now? I don't think so. Money is expensive at the moment. And therefore, if you can use your paper, that's much more attractive for certainly for the, the boards and the management teams, because you are creating larger vehicle on which they can fee off. So I think it's unlikely that somebody else would step in with a cash bid. And we definitely can't see anybody. There's no other company that has um, you know, this is a strategic fit in many respects. Uh, and I can see why custodian are, are doing it from that point of view that you know, both these businesses own the lot sizes are quite small. The diversity of portfolio and sector splits are pretty similar. API has a bit more industrial and a bit more office. So you're going to see that and retail warehousing will come down a bit as a percentage of the combined entity. So there's quite a lot of similarities on that respect. So I don't see it there being another party out there who will uh, necessarily step in. And these are obviously quite small transactions. As you know, over many years, we at TR Property have been uh, generally, if anything, we have our style biases towards better quality businesses where we see the opportunity for growth in the underlying assets through rental growth or development. Uh, and we tend to favour stronger balance sheets and those finance directors who weren't asleep at the wheel 18 months ago and really sort of got their act together in terms of fixing debt, um, securing financing, etc. But at the same time, in the world where we think there's a, a particular sector undergoing M&A activity, uh, and it's certainly, if there is one, when we look pan-Europe, it is the UK, it is these externally managed vehicles were a great wave of them were created from sort of 2014 onwards on the back of the consequences of the GFC, which was the cost of capital dropping to zero. And they were absolutely doing something which the market wanted. They were offering, particularly the wealth management community, an opportunity to get exposure to real estate, to provide a steady income stream. And it didn't matter if you were talking about supermarkets or nursing homes or just a traditional long duration trade such as uh, LXI or secure income reach as it was the previous vehicle. You know, these things absolutely have, have a place. The question now is how do you get economies of scale from these businesses? And the answer is you can, you can put them together. And one of the joys of these businesses is they have these external management contracts, which you pay your break cost. And we saw that with CTPT, which was acquired by London Metric. The break cost was only six months. We're seeing it now with the potential LXI LMP transaction, which is a much larger fee because it had a longer dated contract. And the same with the API deal with custodian. You'll see that torn up. And then the one we were heavily involved in, which was Ediston. And we saw that one year notice period. So there's a simplicity to amalgamating these businesses. So if you're looking at that particular area, then this is a particular part of our strategy, which is very much looking at those businesses that we think 
are going to become part of the merger environment, you know, either to be the hoover or to be the dust, to be sort of more emotional about it. But I would reiterate that is not, you know, central to our longer term strategy for the whole trust. It's just a particular area. And of course, the trust being closed ended is in this wonderful position where it is able to take some long term views, own significant parts of these companies and really be able to get their message, our message across to the boards and remind these boards that they have a fiduciary duty to act on behalf of the owners of the company. And I am aware of a couple of transactions out there that I think going back years probably should have happened and fell because two chairmen both wanted the job. And that is not a good enough reason for transactions not to happen. So uh, I think we applaud particularly you know, the likes of somebody like William Hill, who realised that Edison was too small to stand alone, conducted a strategic review. And whilst I'd hoped for a merger of that company with another one, in fact, it turned out that there was a cash bid from realty income was the best value. And shareholders benefited hugely from that transaction. So you mentioned the LXI deal, and which uh, I think you had some part in that previous deal between LXI and uh, Secure Income REIT. And now they've had this uh, second deal. I mean, LXI, after that uh, previous deal, was already a very substantial company, one and a half billion kind of a market cap. So what is the logic for that? And what was your reaction to that particular proposed deal? And were you indeed arguing for something like that as a large shareholder in the combined vehicle? Yeah, this is a a much harder one for us because at TR Property, we actually have a significant holding in both London Metric and in in, in LXI. The issue for us is these two companies actually do, we think, quite different things. And uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, we're still working through our thoughts on the potential merger. I mean, clearly, they become a very large company in the pan-European real estate equity firmament. And that is a win for everybody that you've got liquidity and you'll be able to attract investors that who wouldn't have been able to invest in these companies when they were separate, because even though they were market caps of, of over a billion, they were still too small for some larger investors. But the question that the boards felt they have answered is that there is a enough a strategic mix for you know all of these assets to come under the, the London Metric umbrella. And Andrew Jones at London Metric has been very, very clever and uh, very good at creating these long income transactions, creating real estate deals that, you know, providing assets to companies who really want those buildings. So prepared to take uh, long leases, whether it's in the retail warehousing sector or logistics or wider industrial, you know, all of that, he, he's done a very good job. So this is a sort of bulking up, as it were. And uh, I suppose if one was looking for a fault for this, the offer is a discount, albeit a small discount to asset value. And I think that you know the timing is fortuitous for London metric shareholders because we are uh, hopefully at peak interest rate. And of course, for these long duration assets, and of course, that is what LXI is. It has a lot of long leased uh, income with annual indexation or caps and collars that you would expect in the coming months and years that we will benefit from rates coming back down. So it's excellent timing for LMP shareholders. And of course, we are one of those. And the question, of course, for LXI shareholders is just, you know, is it enough to jump into the arms of LMP at a small discount to your asset value? And I think it is important to note that Andrew Jones and the team at LMP have had a very, very strong following, very strong rating from from investors over many years. It's just a question mark over where they've just tried to skin the beast that little bit too much here, possibly. Okay, so I think I take a pretty clear message from that, which is very helpful. Thank you. Now, let's just talk about TR Property, of course, which is, as I said, a unique vehicle in the investment trust space. When you came on the podcast, I think it was back in April last year, you were beginning to say that the sell-off that we'd seen in property sector, and particularly in the listed investment trust space, was looking like it was too severe and there were going to be some big opportunities coming along. You also featured, I'm happy to say, in the investment trust handbook this year when you made a similar argument a few months on. And your shares have risen by 15% since certainly the middle of October when the sort of market generally uh, re-rated. So you must be quite pleased with the way things are going. What are your thoughts now about the property sector and the things you're investing in starting from here? Uh, is it still just all about interest rates or are there still a lot of, uh, if you like, underlying value opportunities regardless of what happens to the cost of money? Well, so that's actually the key question, Jonathan. You've hit the nail on the head. We've always felt that it's very dangerous 
strategy to rely on the macro and an assumption that the cost of money is going to fall and that's going to be the only leg to your particular stool. Of course, it is one of the legs to the stool and it is very important. And uh, if you can bring down that cost of debt, then all assets are going to benefit from that. But much more important for us is really the underlying demand for the sectors and the assets that we're invested in. And that is a much more complex picture. It's not as simple as you don't want to own offices because everybody's working from home or you don't want to own retail because people are only shopping online. And of course, those statements are just not true. I, I think the fact of the matter is that these sort of structural changes are essentially washing across the market and certain types of assets are sort of above the waterline and others are going to drown. And what we are seeing, particularly in the office sector, is probably the greater polarisation in tenant demand than I've ever seen. You can see it here and now in London, where we have vacancy in the West End of sort of circa 3 or 4%. Meanwhile, down at Canary Wharf, you can have as much space as you want even if you wanted to sort of create a, an indoor ice rink or bowling, you, know, you could do anything, tennis courts. I mean, there's so much space available. And the fact is that's in one city, you've got a situation where you've got assets that you can guarantee are going to go up in value over the next months and years, and you can almost guarantee other assets that are going to go down. Beyond that, it's really about quality. And what we are seeing is a huge demand for best-in-class office space. We see it across the whole of Europe. We see it in the US as well. And then what's really interesting for us in smaller cities, where there's a very strong return to office culture, and we see it across Europe in Berlin, Milan, Madrid, Stockholm, Gothenburg. It's really only you know, London, to an extent Paris, where we've seen where, you know, if your commute is 60, 70, 80 minutes, well, you'll absolutely avoid that if you possibly can. But if it's 2025, and look, most of it's by car, of course, you're going to return to the office because of all that benefit that you get from being in the office in terms of a collegiate environment. So there are stranded assets out there. There are listed companies that we just almost won't invest in at any cost because we see asset values falling. But at the same time, we see opportunities for best in class. When it comes to retail, I think this is a very interesting environment because we have had literally a decade long correction in pricing because roughly in the UK, we spend about three in every 10 pounds online. Uh, we are at about 30% ex food and fuel. It's not as great a percentage in parts of Europe, but as a consequence, there was a huge amount of excess retail space. Retailers just didn't need the estates that they had previously tooled up for. So we saw them just give back space. But now, and you've heard the likes of Lord Wolfson at Next saying, you know, he's, he's in fact, he's taking space in certain locations. And we are seeing a bottoming out, certainly in rental value. And we actually applaud Mark Allen at Landsec is, is very much laid out his business plan for increasing exposure to best in class dominant shopping centers. And we think that's a really interesting space, particularly if you can acquire this kit at eight, nine, 10 percent. So are there opportunities to pick on those trends in the listed investment trust space? Or are you talking more generally about listed property companies across the continent? Yeah, absolutely. We see very solid earnings in our businesses like Clepier, Euro Commercial, which we're big fans of. I said we mentioned Landsec in the UK. And then retail warehousing, you know, those out of town centres, basically big boxes. They're really benefiting from their ease of access, low service charge. You know, they're literally just sort of big sheds with lots of parking. And that is, you know, particularly in the click and collect and click and return world that we're moving to, you know, because retailers are saying, look, if you want me to send you the stuff, you're going to have to pay for it. And they're, they're benefiting hugely on that. And we're seeing that across Europe as well. Coming back to TR Property itself, obviously you've been doing this for a long time, Marcus, I think it's fair to say. You have a huge amount of experience managing this uh, particular investment trust. Your shares currently have a yield of nudging 5%, I think, something like that. And they're still on a discount of something around 8 or 9%, something like that. Are you still arguing that if you buy shares in TR Property, what you are getting is a discount on a universe which is already at uh, potentially uh, still very wide discounts, despite what's happened to the this modest re-rating we've had since the middle of October, end of the second half of last year anyway? Yeah, absolutely. So just to put some numbers on it, Jonathan, yeah, absolutely. Our world really did begin its recovery at the end of October. And we saw that run, you know, Santa rally all the way through to the end of December. And then we subsequently given a little back in the last couple of weeks. Obviously, the market may have got a little ahead of itself in terms of our rate cuts, particularly in Europe coming as early as March. We didn't think they were. We thought it was more likely to be in the summer. Christine Lagarde has, has very much hinted 
towards the middle of the year. Uh, the market took that a little painfully this week. But even so, as you say, our world, the underlying REITs and property companies that we invest in, they're collectively still trading at 25 to 30% discounts. Um, those have come in from the sort of 35 to 40. Some are trading at par. You know, so it's a, it's a full range, but collectively, when the sort of 25 plus range, the trust is itself standing on about a, a seven discount. So yeah, you are absolutely, when we look at us compared to long-term history, both what we're investing in and our own share price do both look a little cheap. But again, as I said, for me, it's about, am I making sure that the trust is exposed to those underlying companies that have the balance sheet that don't require falls in the cost of debt, that can live comfortably and grow earnings with an environment because, you know, our central case is not that rates drop significantly in 24. We must protect ourselves from that. We must feel, be aware that there is still inflationary pressure, particularly in the cost of services and wages. And who knows what the impact of the cost of shipping will be if, if the Suez situation continues. And obviously the Ukraine war is still continuing. So we're not predicated on that. But our basic view is that even if the cost of money remains at this sort of level through 24, the vast majority of our companies will still grow their earnings. They're trading at discounts. And importantly, you know, compared to private equity, these businesses are not severely levered. I mean, we have an average loan to value in the low 30s. We have companies that have gearing in the 20s. But importantly, a lot of them are not relying on that cost of debt coming down. They've fixed their debt cost certainly out into 26, 27. We're not requiring the bond market necessarily to reopen. Some of them, we've got some businesses in Sweden that are a bit too highly leveraged. We've, we've avoided those. We have some big German residential businesses that do require access to the bond market. They are going to need to refi. But on the other hand, there's 100% occupancy. There's a serious shortage of residential property across the world and particularly in all of the urbanized uh, Europe. So that's another area that's really quite interesting. And then, as I said, there's been very little new development. Post the GFC, banks just were not the lender that they had been to speculative development in previous cycles. We've talked about this before. And you've relied on alternative sources of capital, uh, private equity, long-term uh, institutional wealth, uh, pension funds, superannuation funds, etc. And they just require a higher level of return, weren't prepared to take so much risk. So it's a slightly a case of, you know, if you build it brand new, energy efficient, uh, with the right materials, carbon neutrality, green energy, et cetera, et cetera, the tenants will come in pretty well every asset class. Finally, then, if I can ask you, Marcus, on the issue of cost disclosure, do you think that's been a significant factor in some of the derating we've seen in the property sector until recently? And do you have any great confidence that this problem is going to be sorted out sooner rather than later? We know the government and the FCA are sort of finally on the case. But uh, do you think that's uh, going to have a significant impact if and when it happens? Absolutely. It will help. It will all help. And of course, some wealth managers have been put off, even though the most obvious comparison is something like Tritax, Big Box and Seagrow, one of which is externally managed, the other is internally managed. They both have very similar EPRA cost ratio. So that's the measurement of the cost of actually running the business, except one has to disclose it externally and the other it's seen as an internal cost. And this is a complete nonsense. And clearly, like a lot of bad law, eventually uh, enough people say, well, hold on, this is not a level playing field and we need to sort it out. So do I have great confidence that it will get sorted out? I think my confidence has grown compared to where it was, say, a year ago. And we've finally getting enough sort of uh, of the right heads in the, in the same room. Whether it happens or not and whether it goes far enough, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. In the meantime, it does mean that those internally managed businesses are benefiting. And it is probably a factor in terms of expecting to see you know, potentially some of these businesses continue to internalise. And, and that's what you're seeing with LMP, LXI, sort of almost through the back door. It's an internally managed business taking over an externally managed business. And we were very, very disappointed to see on the press the announcement that a major shareholder of UKCM had declined the approach uh, by Picton. Uh, we thought that would have been an excellent uh, opportunity to bring costs down, to merge two companies you know, with a best-in-class management at, at Picton with larger undermanaged assets at UKCM. So yeah, disappointing to see that. But I think there's ongoing pressure for further consolidation in the sector. 
So that was Marcus Fairmudge, the manager of TR Property, the only investment trust that invests in the shares of other listed property companies, also has a small direct property portfolio, less than 10% of the overall assets. So it was my pleasure this week to catch up with John Singer, who is the chairman of Pantheon International, the private equity trust. He's been chairman there since October 2022 and on the board there since uh, 2016. Now, we'll come on to talk about Pantheon and what you've been doing since you became the chairman of this trust, John. But just kick off by just, can you uh, remind us about your career in the city and particularly your experience in private equity uh, before you took on this particular job? Pleasure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to the program. I started with corporate finance, a very traditional, yeah. left Oxford, went into the city, and seven years of M&A and rights issues, etc., which have been a very sort of useful part of my life. But my life is better understood by I've always wanted to transform things and leave them for the better. So that provided a good reason to sort of leave, go by INSEAD into McKinsey, where one was advising. So that has been useful for strategy. So I had the financial and the strategy, but what I was really aiming for was industry. And what I absolutely adore is running companies. And this was running public company turnaround. So very inelegant, Jonathan. This is steel fabrication, aluminium die casting, walking drag lines, horrible overnight printing presses. And it was running companies that were right on the margin, Banks had appointed me to come in, and they were public companies, which gave me, I have to say, a very clear insight into the pluses and minuses of public versus private and being watched by so many people, you know, with the curtain up the whole time and lights in your eyes. And it was after doing that very enjoyable working in industry that I discovered that he's going sort of private equity and set up the first pan-European private equity fund. And then that led to about 30 years ago, joining Advent International, becoming chairman of Europe, and very, very much taking a very industrial, as you can tell from that background, approach to building businesses and leaving them better than I found them. I left there, and that was then what brought me into investment trusts, which was not what I was particularly looking for, but I had always felt that this was the greatest UK invention, I mean, an amazing 19th century UK invention that we've, I think have not done enough for. And in terms of democratization of all illiquids, not just private equity, it's it's a fantastic, fantastic vehicle. And that was sort of what I didn't want to leave private equity entirely, but I was turned my mind to arts, basically chairing orchestras, conducting myself, playing my piano, trustee at the National Gallery. So it was trying to transform in that side, but this gave me a chance to still hopefully transform something in this democratization mode towards investment trusts. So your background, basically, a lot of it was were getting your hands dirty and uh, sorting out companies that have yes. run into difficulties and doing so on behalf either of lenders and or shareholders. But coming on to investment trust, then, just on that particular point, why do you think it is? It's such a great invention, for, as you say, first one in the 19th century. It's such a great invention that very few other countries have adopted it exactly the same way. I think one has to understand it. I think, and maybe now you'll feel, oh my God, having said how wonderful it is, now he's demeaning it. I suppose I've always thought of an investment trust more as a vessel, a baking mold. They're basically lots and lots of Mary Berries who can do the crucial job of deciding what contents to put into that mold. And of course, they could choose lots of different molds or not to use a mold at all and just put something, the dough straight into the oven. So the mold is a constricting force, in a sense, which has a lot of rules, of, has become more and more regulated, and therefore doesn't please everybody. But to me, it is an amazing mold because it does allow the Peter Paul Marys to know what it is that they're actually putting their money into, that there are rules, and to get them into things they otherwise couldn't do. But I have to say, it still for me, and this is personal bias, perhaps because of my background, it is still the contents that actually are the most crucial. And therefore, boards of ITs, in my humble view, should have majority of people coming from private equity, not being fantastic administrators, regulators, etc. There are plenty of people to provide that input. You need to know it, you've got to respect it, and you've got to be a very strong governance person. But you also have to really understand, and that's why Pantheon, yes, must 
majority of us have had a long, long experience because that's a lot, a lot of the issues that we're discussing on behalf of shareholders really require sort of fingerspitzgefühl, feeling in the tips of your fingers. I understand the sector. Right. And that's a very important point, I think. We're going to talk about the role of boards in a moment. But in terms of private equity, traditionally, one of the several arguments that are put forward in favor of private equity as opposed to listed companies is that, if you like, you can be more hands-on, you can get things done quicker in some cases. And yet, there's, sometimes there may be a tension between that and the kind of processes you have to go through as a listed company, which investment trusts are. So I guess I'm asking you, do you think that a listed investment trust that invests in private equity is a sensible creation, if I can put it that way? It seems like an oxymoron, Jonathan. I quite agree. And that was definitely my first going back many years and having, of course, because yes, I've only been seven years on the board of an investment trust, but more than 30 years of working with investment trusts on the side. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, poor guys. I mean, is this logical? Actually, you said to be able to do things quickly. I see it actually rather the other way. Yes, there have always been quick flips, which actually now is not as quick as it used to be. And the name again, and it's a longer term game. And actually, what is really nice is that if ITs are used in the right way, they are for longer term investors. And we're all sharing actually in the same sort of objectives, which may not be the ones that, say, corporate investors, activists, etc., are looking for. But even they, in fairness, would prefer to see something that is growing over time. So no, I think, yes, there are bound to be tensions. But what you're doing is not trying to just repeat the same thing that's happening in the world of limited partners, general partners on something that's quoted. You're actually trying to provide accessibility for people who otherwise do not have a hundred million pounds sitting in the bank in which they can divide into 10 funds, which each have a minimum of 10 million pounds to invest. This is a different game. This is allowing people with a hundred pounds and wanting diversification and wanting actually which I hope we will be covering, a pretty safe bet, in fact, a very, very safe bet in an active management way to play in the game. And from that point of view, the logic to me is absolutely clear. But you have to look at it really more from that point of view, I think. Even if it's institutions that are investing, it is providing a liquidity which, to quote beer advertisements, you know, others can't quite reach. So I, I think there is a logic for it. As always in any form of investing, Jonathan, I'm sure you would agree, different strokes for different folks. And you have to know what it is you're going into something for and why. And I think that in, we are going to be discussing things where we're going to find that, sadly, things have not been explained, things are not understood, and there are vast misunderstandings about private equity, which is to the detriment of both sides, private equity and, sadly, to a universe of investors who actually could really benefit if they only knew and felt confident about that asset class. Right. So as you say, private listed private equity trusts, they offer ordinary investors certainly a chance to invest in an asset class, which they couldn't normally do themselves, and to benefit from the experience that is there. And also, to the extent that there is some diversification there as well, you get that as well. So that's all good. Now, as you say, there have been some issues there with listed private equity, it's fair to say, over the years. Let's just dive straight into one of the biggest ones, which is the issue of discounts. So one of the paradoxes, I think, about listed private equity is that despite making claims that their long-term performance can be superior in many cases to listed public equities, not always, but in some cases, but they do have this issue of discounts in the investment trust sector. And seems to reach a state where it has become sort of more or less accepted that private equity listed investment trusts should trade at a discount. And in many cases, it's been quite a big discount. When you took over as chairman of Pantheon in uh, October 22, I mentioned, I think the discount was around 50% in the case of Pantheon, which really is an extraordinary figure. If I can it mildly, we saw it back in the uh, global financial crisis, something similar. But to have a, a high quality set of businesses that you have, trading at a 50% discount is a pretty strange state of affairs. I'm sure you'll agree with that. And you're trying to change that uh, perception and that reality. Correct. It is bizarre, I think. I'd allow myself that word. And because I've always had to deal with problems and putting them right, my attitude is always to say, okay, let's make hypotheses as to what's going wrong here. And I think the crucial thing is that everybody starts with discounts. And that's the wrong place to start. And I think, therefore, really the message that I'd really love to give is that my journey in those six years of being on the board without being a chairman and then as a chairman has really been trying to get underneath that to understand what is going wrong. 
Because at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is to equate supply and demand at a lower level of discount. And the first thing one has to understand is there is no silver bullet. There is no one single bullet. There are so many bright people in this industry, so many people. If there was a single bullet, it would have been found, it would have been utilized. So the answer is no. It is a mixture of things. And in fact, I chose Pantheon. I would never have gone into the sector except that I was approached by Pantheon at a time when I was involved in my arts, culture, and education bits. And I'd known Helen Steers for 30 years. And what I admired about them, and this is where it all starts, and the reason why they, I'm not going to use the word uniquely because that's going to get me into huge trouble, but they have an extraordinary level of culture based on trust, based on ethics, based on values. It sounds all very wishy-washy, but actually, in my experience, these are the drivers of success in businesses more than any specific skills and experiences. And they have a very strong sense of governance and the way that boards and executive teams should work together, respecting the red lines. We'll talk about that later. But even they were not doing, I felt, six years very frustrated because I felt there was something to be done. And that was why when I was asked, will you do the chairmanship? This was actually, I had no interest in adding another chairmanship to my CV, the last thing in the world that either my wife or I wanted me to do. But it was a real challenge because of this sort of getting caught up on discount. And so that is what led me to go out and talk with my board's permission and, and executive team's encouragement to 20 to 25 of our biggest investors, one-on-one, chat about rules, and try to, first of all, test out my hypotheses about their unhappiness. And sure enough, it was things like, nobody comes to you, you're the first chairman that's come to really talk in depth about these things. Nobody listens. There's no dialogue, and therefore no action. Secondly, really, this is such a complex industry. We do not have time to try to work it all out for ourselves, but no one's bothering to simplify and to educate us. And it's not our responsibility, chum, it's yours. This is collectively, this was nothing to do with PIP. This was to do with investment trust generally and private equity even worse. Then, of course, there are the whole trust issues and what are the KPIs that we can really look at at portfolio company level as investors see at investor meetings, but we don't, and it's all just aggregated. We just hear now it's going to work by X and X, et cetera. And there's this whole list of things that added up to a sort of lack of trust, of course, in the valuations, which it gets the heart of, and a lack of understanding, this complete confusion between public and private. The only thing that actually is uniting them is this word equity, which very confusingly is being used in both. So here we have something where no one is really explaining that actually private equity is a completely different. When you use words like active and passive management, they just simply do not relate in the same way to private as they do to public. And we're dealing with a bit of industry that has suffered too much from arrogance, not bothering to educate, very opaque. It has been, I have to say, I'm sorry to say, even when I was chairman of the European Venture Capital Association, trying to change it. So I think there are a lot of factors involved and so you know, before really talking about capital allocation and things that you're just talking about, I'd say, well, it all starts with actually the fact that there is no one silver bullet. And therefore, what we tried to do is actually a, a long story, which started about four years ago. And then what everyone is talking about is one element in the three-step plan, which is part of that journey. So I'm very happy to talk about that, what we've been trying to do to try to correct that distrust. But it's not just a matter of doing a buyout and everything changes. No, it doesn't. You don't go from 50. Yes, we've gone from that 50, you know, look today, uh, but 37%, something like that. So the trust is slowly coming back, but it's a long-term journey. So before we look at the three-point plan and what that represents, you put your finger on a number of things there about perceptions of the private equity industry, that it is rather arrogant. They're quite pleased with themselves. Yeah. They make quite a lot of money, or they make a lot of money. The fees are quite high in, in many cases compared to other things. And they've just sort of been happy to settle for always trading at a discount, almost regardless of what that discount is. You can't say that the listed private equity trust industry is beyond reproach anyway. There is a sort of implication that they have not been doing the right thing over the last few years. And they've had a slightly, uh, if I can put it rather crudely, a sort of up yours to the shareholders, if I can put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> that might be pretty a little strong, but would you accept there is some validity in that? 
I think we'll be talking a lot about perception versus reality. Perception is definitely, it's up yours. <laughs> I may borrow your elegant phrase, Jonathan. Right. <laughs> and trying to work out what a behavioral psychologist might say is the reason behind it. I think it is, yes, if people get overcomfortable and, you know, you're just happy with tweaking and you think, well, why change it? And there's no point. Everyone expresses their frustrations. I would disagree about happy with. No, um, all the chair reports of other trusts, I, I, I've, uh, you know, sort of start by saying, we are just as frustrated as you are. We're doing all of this and we are just as frustrated. But that is the point when you have to say, well, okay, is this something forever? And I said to my board, you know, if we really think a 50% discount is something that cannot be changed, my strong advice is let's liquidate the fund ourselves because we will do it for the benefit of our shareholders rather than let someone corporate coming in who will do it mainly to put in their pockets rather than our existing investors. Let's do the decent thing for our existing investors. Let's close down the fund. And that was why we went to test out lots of hypotheses. And our conclusion is, no, there are things that we can do. But it can't be done by one on its own. And one of the things, no doubt, you know, you probably asked me, what is the reaction from others and from those shareholders and, you know, what we're doing? And if you like, it's a very positive response, but with the sort of follow-up, yeah, okay, now get others to do it as well. In other words, I said to my board, again, just to try to illustrate the point, are we doing this to be a sole beacon of light in a valley of gloom, which is investment trust generally and private equity ones specifically, or are we trying to do this to see if we can re-rate the sector and break down this perception and actual sort of uh, divide and actually show people how valuable it is to have this access through these very valuable 19th century vehicles. And I have to say the whole board said, agreed. If we were doing it to be a bright light, forget it. We'll never get anywhere. Let's go for the liquidation plan. And I'm now working on, and I've written to some of my dear colleagues in the industry who instantly, in one case I wrote to initially, uh, I got a response in 30 minutes from one, 45 minutes from the other saying, yes, let's meet. So I think one shouldn't be too gloomy. I think that there is a sort of feeling, my God, what we've done hasn't worked. Is there some way forward? Hopefully it doesn't involve spending 200 million on a buyout, and it doesn't mean having to do that. There is some way of changing the perceptions for the whole sector, and we should be perceived for what we are. So it's not an easy five-second process. But I am at this stage still optimistic that we can do it, but it requires a lot of work. Well, there are lots of things to unpick here, but let's uh, pick up on one question which you mentioned, which is, in the current climate at least, there are a number of observers, if you like, investors too, who think that the discounts are effectively overstated. In other words, that the net asset values are not what they're being reported as. So in order to reduce the discount, you can reduce it in two ways. You can take steps to bring it nearer to the reported net asset value that is today, or you could reduce the net asset value when you're valuing the portfolio to bring it down towards where the share price is. It's a key part of what you're saying is that the valuations that you put out there to the extent that there's a whole series of industry guidelines and so on, you would say to people that the net asset values are correct or as near correct as uh, they can be in uh, in a market that's driven by yeah, supply and demand. Yeah. I'm not going to vouch for every single valuation of every single sort of trust, liquids, real estate, etc. But I think the time has come, John, just to sort of perhaps to say the big difference between public and private. It's right for public markets to re-rate in the way that they have done because they look at macro factors and they just say, ah, what are the impact of those on my valuations? Oh, I must reflect those. And oh, profit warnings, et cetera. And that is because that model for private markets is effectively consists of two dots. One is capital and the other is quoted companies. And effectively, it's all about sort of putting capital into companies. And you either do it actively or passively. You either try to pick your stocks or the flack that active investors getting into at the moment. It's cyclical again. I've lived through many cycles on this one. Or you sort of go for passive and say, you know, and the fees and et cetera, et cetera. Now, the thing about private equity and why it has nothing to do with that model, and when we talk about valuations, we have to talk about something completely different. There's a third factor who you could call the manager or the person who's trying to add value and transform those businesses. That does not exist in public companies. I mean, even your friend and my very, very close friend, Tony Bolton, was the closest. I really respected what he did at his special situations because he was actually trying at least to ask 
questions like a due diligence of a private equity person. But my God, that was rare and was a lot of hard work, but it got him to a position which is great. Now, in our case, in private equity, that third player is playing a highly active role. So when something goes wrong, whether it is wars, whether it is that shipping lanes get closed, et cetera, et cetera, the reaction is immediately to pull out, you know, you're close to your companies because you're working first of your own, you're working, this is why they have operating partners, portfolio support managers, a very expensive lineup of people who are 100% of the time working with the companies. And when something goes wrong that could affect the strategic plan, the reaction is not, as in a public, oh, we better mark down, oh, because markets are somehow right, and we who are actually running the companies are wrong. No, question your strategic plan and say, do we need to go to plan B? And actually, the chances are that when you bought the company, you have had 20 different scenarios of what could go wrong and what one would do if. And It is that point which explains the fact that actually you have that flexibility because you're close to the company to actually make the changes that are necessary and say, well, okay, we may have diminished value because this plan isn't quite as good as our original plan. However, no, it does not require a 50% reduction in value. And I think that this is something that is just not taken into account. It is a sort of a major difference in sort of saying, is this value fair or not? Now, the market prefers to ignore the fact that I can take a Pantheon figure, but actually it's the whole market. If you look at the uplifts at the time of exit on valuations, it's not just that actually the Pantheons of this world are getting back the money that the companies were valued at. Our average over a long period has been 30%. And even this last year, a really bad year, was still well in the 20% of additional value compared to what we had it in the books for. And in our case, it's gone back through the 35 years that we have been in this game. Uh, So I'm just using an example that I know, where it's over 20%. So actually, there is plenty of evidence, but because of the lack of trust and everything else, there's feeling we will ignore data, we will ignore hard facts. We will ignore the fact that we understand why value is maintained and the fact that for 35 years we proved it is. We will ignore the fact that the underlying companies in this portfolio, the average growth still going on is 20% plus of EBITDA per annum, even in the bad times, because of this ability to actively manage. We don't have passive management of private equity. You're not doing private equity, you know, a pure fund of funds, yes. But at the moment, you know, and once you move away from that model, which most are, I mean, we are, and that's why I say it's a long journey, already five years ago, we started moving away to where our investment into funds is only a third, and the sort of 55% is in single assets. Yes, we understand what those valuations are. Yes, we're involved in each of those single asset valuations. Yes, in our case, Ernst Young are looking at sort of random samples and checking that the way we value businesses is correct. And therefore, we feel very confident in what we say. We can prove it by history. There's no reason to believe that that is going to change. And we are in control of the exits anyway and how we exit. So to some extent, you could say it's inertia. And in another, there is a sort of sense of, Jesus, whatever we do, we're not getting believed. We've got to do more to win back the trust. And then they will realize that actually private equity and public equity are two completely different ways of running portfolios for different people, for different things. And I think then we have a chance, perception and reality. So it's not that everybody's bad. You know, and just to show the importance of this, you know, this fees debate, which again, you may want to address at some stage, but all I'd say at this stage is, apart from the unfairness of crips or kids or whatever, that's an argument in itself. But the issue is that no one would deny that to run actively a portfolio in private equity is a much more expensive because it is a day by day affair of actual people. But why is it that nobody bothers to focus on the net, 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 net returns? For example, Pantheon, it's for 35 years, net, 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 12% per annum. And that isn't what's focused on. It's, oh, let's just look at the sort of comparative costs. 
they don't look at even gross. It just simply, no, you just look at costs. You compare different types of investment, public markets, private investment, and you say, let's not touch private equity because the costs are high. Wait a moment. Private equity, again, not correctly, but actually all upper quartile and second quartile players are outstripping other returns of MSCI and other media. And yet, you know, people sort of say, let's focus on the fees and looking at sort of gross and not on the net. I'm trying to paint a picture to say that I think perceptions are wrong and that we have got a lot more to do than just simply one weapon to try to change a history, which I would say is sadly focusing on the wrong things and mixing up two completely different topics and comparing one with the other unfairly. The implication of what you were saying, though, is that therefore the kind of uh, trajectory you'd expect to see in net asset values of a private equity is probably going to be less volatile than equivalent public listed equities because we know that uh, public markets are more moody, if you like. Let's put it that way. <laughs> they do go to swings it's- from one way to another. They do it to extremes in some cases. You know, again, this is personal views that we're sharing, Jonathan. I have to say it is why I moved to private equity to transform businesses where I didn't have to worry about the quarterly reports and people being moved by sentiment rather than by facts. As you can tell from a McKinsey man, I am horribly driven by data, by, you know, facts, as well as by EQ things. So it's IQ and EQ. And that's why I value this private equity market. And the very fact that, sadly, we are sort of losing more and more IPO companies and the number of private companies are growing and growing means that the old joy of going to the golf club and saying, I run a public company, that joy for a whole world, that's a different topic of its own, you know, is going. And there is this growing number of private companies, which is exactly what an a pantheon, but we are absolutely specialized in trying to help the investor in the street, as well as the institutional sophisticated investor, to get into the best of. And I suppose I should say against the profession. Well, it's not against the profession, but it shows how important it is to be in the hands of someone with a good track record. I used to keep statistics for 35 years. And whereas the difference between entry into the top quartile and bottom quartile for quoted is about 4% over that 35 years, if you take private equity, the difference between entry into the upper quartile and the bottom quartile is 24%. In other words, you want to avoid those bottom two quartiles and you need to be in the hands of people who really know what they're doing. Hence my comment about why Panthen over half the board actually can talk knowledgeably with the management team because we do not want to be anywhere near those bottom quartile companies, those two lower quartiles or the companies that they invest in. So it does have a wider variation, but the moral of that is not, oh, let's keep away from it. There's too wide a dispersion. No, stick to those who can show, you know, if I ask you to guess what our loss ratio is over the past 10 years, and loss here means not just the company is completely lost, but including damage to the value of the business. Do you think that our 10 years loss, some of which actually is never lost because they just recover, would it be 0%, 2%, 5%, 10%, 20%, or 25%? I'm minded to think it's quite a small number. So I'd probably say 5%, yeah. 2%. And it's just part of this, again, perceptions and how volatile is it? How dangerous is it? So you have all of this evidence on the one side of the uplift the very low, practically non-existent loss factor, but still these perceptions. So again, it's a complex question you have asked. Indeed it is. So let me say this then. If you look at the listed private equity sector, notwithstanding what we've been saying about the general industry issues, there are significant differences in the ratings of different listed private equity vehicles. At one end, you have something like literary capital, which is a trading around par. Then you've got things like HG Capital, which normally traded around par or a premium, now gone out to quite a big discount, but not as big as yours. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got some of these very long established, but they are mainly fund of funds listed private equity, which are on very big discounts and, and persistently big discounts. So even within the small listed private equity world, there are differences and uh, presumably the differences in uh, quality as well as in approach. It is such a great question, Jonathan, as you well know. You rightly have a smile on your face as you ask it. And you're quite right. 
there's a mixture of things. There are certain things, when I look at the criteria, what could be influencing what are the strokes and folks? So there are certain things which are actually in common with public companies. In other words, geographic. So we are highly global. Does everybody like global? Are there some who prefer, you know, it's, it's denominated in sterling. I'd like to have all our investments in pounds. Maybe you've mentioned one or two names where there is a stronger pull towards the home rather than ourselves, which is, as I say, covers the world because we have offices everywhere through our manager. Is it sort of leverage? Others have been much more aggressive in the use of leverage. And that, in the good times of the last 10 years, has affected performance in a positive way. You may have read we've just done a substantial 150 million private placement, which was three times oversubscribed. You know, it gives us 10-year money. It's, so we're still, you can say, being conservative by doing this. So we can do buyouts on a long-term basis. I feel very confident. But it is, leverage is still less than 5% with all of that. <laughs> and some would say, oh, gosh, no, no, I prefer a risky again. Fine, then look for a higher sense of leverage. And if things work out well, if we don't have a period like we've just had now, maybe you'll feel more excited about doing that. I think risk is you know, diversification. I think that you will find differences there. We are, again, appealing to individual and institutional, sophisticated investors who are not looking to put everything into 10 or 15 companies. Nothing wrong with that. Choose someone else. We have quite a wide diversification. We are narrowing it all the time by cutting down the number of funds we invest in and going more for single assets. But we still want to sort of say to people, look, if you want coverage here, and therefore they may turn to us or they may turn to someone else. So I think risk appetite and you know what you go for is um, sectors, I think there's probably more commonality there, but obviously uh, venture capital has, the technology funds have taken, you know, they, they got, let's say, a little over-enthusiastic British understatement in the 21-22 period. So we are seeing changes occurring there and funds have different, you know, are we going for a Tesla or are we going for growth? We offer growth, so it'll appeal to someone who's looking for growth, but who wants technology and healthcare, but technology that's very much related to software, to things that are going on in the office or, or what have you, which you can relate, not unicorns. So I think, you know, you're going to find the different strokes for different folks. Something that I think is worth mentioning is size of company. This is a really interesting one, and I think this is why private equity, I feel very, very comfortable for the future. At Pantheon, yes, 65% of our companies are SMEs and growth. Only 26% are large. Buyouts altogether is about 61%, and pure venture is 3%. We had a, a dinner with about uh, 15 colleagues you would know very well from the, the media world. And I first of all told them verbally a pie chart of the amount of money going into size of businesses measured by employees. As you'd expect, huge volumes of money in private equity were going into businesses of above 5,000 employees, real biggies, the ones that journalists love to write about all the time. And I then said, let's look at number of investments in private equity. Now, we're looking at, in all private equity, the number of investments. What percentage do you think of numbers of investments goes into businesses of less than 99 people. Actual answer, 78.8%. Not picked up by journalism, not picked up by media, people misunderstanding. And that's why there is this amazing future for growth companies. If you go into the right vehicles, because actually you don't need Teslas for growth. You need really a solid base of people who understand small to medium-sized businesses. And there's a lot of potential, especially with public companies not being quite the vehicle that they used to be for growth. Sadly, sadly. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.